So our scripture this morning is in uh, chapter 15 of the Gospel of Luke. We'll be reading verses one through seven. If you're following along in your pew Bibles, that's on page 848. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. This is the word of the Lord. Well, late in the dark night, March 21st, 1748, about 270 or so years ago, there was a 22-year-old sailor named John. He was awoken. He was on a ship, awoken by gale force winds battering his ship. As he struggled along with the other crew to pump the water out of the ship, but feeling it was getting more and more hopeless, the ship was sinking. This sailor, John, considered his life as he pumped and pumped away. Sailor John's moral life, in truth, had already sunk. He was a wicked and insubordinate young man. He had a profane tongue, a flesh-driven appetites and a stone-cold heart. He gambled his way into debt. He dabbled in witchcraft. He was sexually promiscuous. Later, as he moved up the ranks, he became captain of a slave-trading ship, very common, of course, at that time. And most likely, he, he indulged his lusts even further by assaulting and perhaps raping African women on the ship as slaves. He didn't particularly enjoy alcohol, but he liked to, to drink alcohol so that he could prompt drunkenness in others for his own entertainment. This man, Sailor John, was immune from no kind of sin. He delighted not just in walking himself into sinfulness, but into leading others into temptation. He, he called himself a ringleader in blasphemy and wickedness. If any man was unworthy of deliverance in, in the raging sea, it was 22-year-old sailor John. But it was in that moment as he stood there, uh, sat there reflecting on his life, pumping away at the water, trying to get the water out of the ship, that for the first time in his life, he called out to God. He asked for help. I think you could say accurately that there are few people in the history of the world who are as wicked as this man. And yet God saved him. God saved him and the crew on that ship. And God changed his life. Became a Christian. Trusted in, in Jesus. Sailor John, as some of you may have recognized, is John Newton. The great hymn writer. And, and if you don't recognize the name John Newton, perhaps you, you would know that, that he, one of his hymns he wrote is more famous than, than almost any national anthem. It is, of course, Amazing Grace, in which he wrote, I once was lost, but now am found. The story of John Newton being lost and then found is what Luke 15 is all about. 
We talked last week about the context of this, that that Dale helpfully read those first two verses to to give us a sense that Jesus isn't just telling us this fairy tale type story with a moral lesson, but but he's in the middle of an argument with religious leaders. And and he's trying to burst open, if you remember from last week, to, to break open this paradigm that the religious leaders had. This false paradigm was that good people are saved and bad people are lost. But instead, what Jesus is doing here in in Luke chapter 15 is to say, no, no, there are two ways to be lost, not just one way to be lost. You can be lost by breaking all the rules, but you can also be lost by keeping all the rules. Both good people and bad people are lost. Both good people and bad people need Jesus. And as we got that context last week, now we dive into these three parables, the lost sheep, and the next week, the lost coin, and finally, the lost sons. As Jesus fleshes this out in story form. But again, these stories are pointed, sharp arguments that he is making. And this morning, we see very clearly, as pointed directly at these Pharisees and teachers of the law, God's heart his priority, his joy for seeing even the worst of sinners who are lost, see them found and saved. The parable is is fairly simple. First, we, we have the sheep that strays. Sheeps stray. You know, in the, the Bible, it's very common for God's people to be called sheep. We see that. We'll, we'll look at in, in your insert in the bottom. There's a bunch of passages there that I'll cite this morning that you can look up later that, that talk about this relationship between God as being the shepherd and, and we are as the sheep in and, and Psalms and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and John. Now, typically when we hear sheep and shepherds, we, we have this picture of sort of this, this soft, fuzzy, warm sort of relationship, right? So, and again, I think there's something true about that, but, but it misses, I think, the, the first century and perhaps a, if for more an agrarian culture, it, it misses an element there in that sheep are not exactly intelligent. This is quite an insulting image that God has for his people. And in fact, in this illustration of sheep, the Lord is emphasizing for us both the, the definition of sin and also the depth of our sin and looking at the, the sheep straying. So sheep are renowned for being dumb, directionless, defenseless. You know, I did read this week, I did some research, and there are some sheep truthers out there that they've done studies and they say, no, they're, they're actually brilliant and they recognize faces and they can kick a little bit to defend themselves, but... But then after that, I I read a story from a few years ago in in Turkey where some some Turkish shepherds uh, decided, this is in the BBC, it's legit, right? So so decided to to go get lunch and they left their their sheep and and one of the sheep wandered away and fell off a a cliff, a 50 foot high cliff. And the other sheep saw that sheep and said, oh, we're gonna gonna follow. (laughs) One after another after another 1,500 sheep slowly walking. Imagine 1,500 sheep jumping off the fifth fifth floor of an apartment building, one by one by one. It it was so ridiculous that, so it was really terrible actually, right? So 400 of the sheep died. The other 1,100 actually survived only because they landed on the other sheep and it was kind of a, cu- a cushion landing, right? So, so again, I, I get the truthers. Maybe they have a little bit of uh, intelligence, but in reality, from thousands of years of history, shepherds will tell you sheep are not very smart. They go astray. They get lost. It's just what they do. It's, it's what sheep do. And, and so Jesus says here that we are like sheep. We get lost. We stray from our shepherd. And so this gets into the definition of sin, right? So Jesus, in talking to the Pharisees, doesn't say that this sheep broke the rules. 
He doesn't even explicitly say that the sheep sinned in this way or that way, but, but said that the sheep wandered away. The sheep was lost. At the very heart, the definition of sin isn't just breaking the rules, the law of God, but it is running from God. Isaiah 53 says, as Whitney cited in the prayer of confession, another example, Isaiah, we, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Apostle Paul picks this up in Romans chapter 3 and saying, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks after, who goes after God. Instead, we all have turned away like sheep. And so ultimately, what is this lost sheep doing? They're not completely dumb and where they're just wandering and have no idea where they're going. Do you know what motivates the sheep to wander away from the shepherd? Does anyone know? Food. It sees grass that it likes and it goes and just starts eating and it keeps going and going and going until it's wandered away from the rest of the flock. I didn't say in the article, but I imagine there was probably some kind of growth that went right up to the edge of that cliff that caused all of those sheep to fall. What sheep who stray are saying is, shepherd, I, I will get my own food. I, I know where the best sustenance and satisfaction is for me. Not in your bounds. Not near you. And of course, this is really the definition of sin. You go all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden, right? It, it wasn't just about an arbitrary fruit on a tree that God said they, they couldn't have. Right? If you remember in Genesis 3, the, the conversation that, that Satan, the serpent, has with Eve, says, Eve, essentially, God's holding out on you. He says he loves you. He says he's giving you his best, but, but he's holding out. He doesn't really love you. You can get even more knowledge and power. You can be just like God. You can be your own God. That is the source of sin. Rejecting the sovereignty of God, rejecting the rule, the love of God, doubting, questioning whether God has our best interests in mind and wandering away. And the truth is, church, is that we, as, as Whitney prayed again in the confession, we need this constant reminder, this constant redirecting, because we are, even those as believers, we are like sheep who do go astray. We need to be pulled back into the flock instead of continuing to eat our way off a cliff. You see, this idea of eating is symbolism in the Lord's Supper, which we'll celebrate this morning. You know, Jesus says his, his body, that, that his sacrifice for us, that, that he is like food for us, our, our sustenance, that, that we need to, to feed on him, again, symbolically, that, that our greatest and most foundational need of food should come from him. But how easy we look towards those supposedly greener pastures, what we really desire is the pastures of our own comfort and security, right? We say, yeah, I'm part of the flock. I'm good, but I'm just going to go eat over here and spend more and more of my time and attention and energy feeding over here from this other pasture. I'm going to put my soul, my attention, all of my, my desires into my work. I'm going to put all of my attention and desires into this dating relationship. Neglect the shepherd. Even good things, even good works can turn sinful as they pull you away from God. The God is the one, the shepherd, who can truly satisfy us. I remember, I'm about to out myself here, and I, I apologize in advance, but I am a, a uh, uh, was raised outside of Philadelphia, and so I am actually a Philadelphia Eagles fan. And so a couple years ago, uh, we won the Super Bowl against the Patriots. Sorry about that. It was the one time I was really rooting against the Patriots because the Patriots have like, you know, a million Super Bowls. The Eagles had never won. Ever, right? Ever. 
And so we are the Super Bowl, and the city of Philadelphia is going crazy, and we win the Super Bowl. And I remember saying, I, I, I mean, wait, he was, I, I can't believe it. I, just, I was just dumbfounded that we had won the Super Bowl. But then the next day I was like, oh yeah, we won the Super Bowl. What's next? You know, maybe when, when Tom Brady won that first Super Bowl, was it 2001, I think, when the Patriots first won? But maybe you had a similar feeling. Oh yeah, now that they've won. Now, I mean, I guess you go try to win another one. I mean, that's good, but the, the, the satisfaction sort of dies down. You think about other areas of your, your life and in your work and your relationships and your bank account. At what point will you be satisfied and secure with yourself that you are good enough? How many papers do you have to publish? How many papers to be the first author on the paper do you have to publish? How, how many experiments do you, do you have to push the scholarship forward? How many promotions in your job? How many figures in your paycheck? How comfortable do you have to be? How big of a house do you have to have? How many vacations do you have to take in order to say, okay, I'm, I'm satisfied? And churches know for me, I apply this to myself. And here's the thing about sin, even in the, in the course of ministry, right? How big does the church have to get before I'm satisfied? How, how fixed up does the building need to get before I say, yes, we've, we've made it? There's never an end. You'll keep wanting more and more and more, and it will never be enough. Or, or at worst, you, you'll get to it, the end, and you'll realize the, the emptiness, like sugar that doesn't truly satisfy. The definition of sin, straying from God, not only for bad things, even for good things. Important to watch over our hearts in and, and thinking about this. And again, to the Pharisees who... They were just as lost as these sinners pursuing good things. But this idea of sheep doesn't just show us the, the definition of sin, but also the depth of our sin. If you look with me at, at verse 5, it says that when the shepherd finds it, he joyfully puts the sheep on his shoulders and, and goes home. And maybe you have that, that picture of sort of a, a shepherd putting the, the sheep on his shoulders. Just how, how intimate, how, how nice that he's just carrying this, this sheep back. But, but do you know why shepherds have to carry sheep on their shoulders? It's because unlike a dog or a cat, if you find a lost dog or a lost cat, you say, oh, great. Let's come on home, and they'll walk home with you. Sheep, don't do that. They, they won't come with you, right? That's why you have to have the dog, herding dogs, or you have to pick them up, tie them up, or just put them right over your shoulders and carry them home. There's, there's some video, you can Google it. It went viral online of, of a sheep that got itself stuck in a, a hole and almost completely submerged in this hole. And the video shows this shepherd pulling at the legs of this thing, just pulling it out of the hole and putting it on his back and walking him, walking him back home. And, and this, this idea of us being sheep, it, it shows us that, that we, we can't walk our way back to God. We, we are completely desperate. You know, maybe you're here and you're, you're exploring Christianity and, and you think, okay, yeah, Christianity is about just sort of living a moral life, trying to follow as best I can the example of Jesus. But, but the problem is, is that that's, that's more of a dog or cat perspective, not a sheep perspective. The Bible says that all humanity is lost in sin and that no one can do anything to contribute to their salvation. That even faith, even repentance is a gracious gift from God. We are that lost. And if you struggle with the idea of the, you know, us being so lost and so sinful, I just encourage you, just hang out with a toddler for a little bit and you will see from an early age, the sin, the lostness is there. I love my sons. I love them, but it's there. You talk to parents, it's true. It's there. It starts from the very beginning. We are sinful by nature. 
And so Jesus wasn't just a, a great teacher to emulate, right? A teacher coming wouldn't have been enough. And in fact, back in, in Luke chapter 11, Jesus says that God sent teachers to Israel, to his people, over and over and over again. These were the prophets. And he says, hey, you killed them. The sheep with teeth who, who bit and did not listen, they wouldn't come. No, we needed not a teacher, but a savior who by the gift of his grace can bring us all the way home. Verse six. The sheep stray. And this brings us now to the shepherd, uh, num number two. So this image of, of the sheep, we see both the definition of sin, that sin isn't just breaking the rules, but it's actually wandering away from God, rejecting God in your life. But secondly, we see in, in the idea of sheep is that it's the depth of our sin. We can't contribute anything to our own salvation. We need the shepherd to come and get us. So we see this image of the sheep that strays. Now, of course, the, the beautiful part of this story, the shepherd. And the shepherd we see here both searches and sings. You see in verse 4 that the shepherd leaves the 99. And we don't know. He says, doesn't he leave the 99 sheep? We don't know. Is he, is he leaving them with another shepherd? Is he just leaving them completely in the wilderness by themselves? We don't, we don't exactly know. But, but the emphasis is not on the 99. The emphasis is on the one. All of the, the focus and the importance and, and the attention is on the lost one. It seems almost unfair in the normal economy. You think about the, the hundred sheep. Which out of the hundred sheep was, was the dumbest? Which was the most broken? Which, which one's moral performance was the worst? That is the one that got all of the attention, all of the focus of the shepherd. We have a God who values even the worst sinner like John Newton. I remember uh, when I was in college, I, my, I had a professor who was confused because I was a Christian and no one else in my class was, was a Christian. And uh, he knew that I had a, I'm, I'm half Jewish and I have a Jewish background. So I was talking with him in my office. And he says, so you really believe that in this, this grace thing, right? That, that God will forgive any sins if someone turns, really believes, commits their life to him. I said, yeah. He says, all right, well, I know you're Jewish. The professor was uh, Jewish as well. And so he said, well, what about Adolf Hitler? I was like, well, I don't know that he turned or penned. He said, I know, I know. He probably didn't. We don't know. But, but let's say that instead of committing suicide, Adolf Hitler perhaps ended up in, in prison. And maybe in prison later in his life that he realized that the weight of what he had done, the, the millions of, of people whose blood was on his hand. And he turned to God and said, God, I realize I was wrong. Forgive me. Would God have said, you know, I, I'll forgive anyone, but that is too much. And I told him no. I said, if Adolf Hitler sincerely turned to God for forgiveness, if God truly did save him in some hypothetical situation, then the grace of God is enough to overcome even the worst of sins. And he was trying to set me up with this radical example that would make me hedge or question. But if we truly believe it, then even the most radical, broken sinners of our world can be forgiven by Jesus. This parable in Luke 15 is pretty much an echo. Uh, Jesus is pulling a lot from Psalm 23. In Psalm 23, it, it talks about in, in verse 3 that, that the shepherd you know, leads me by quiet waters. And then verse 3, it says he refreshes my soul or restores my soul. And that word is actually the, the Hebrew word, an intensive Hebrew word for turning, that you turn my soul back to yourself for repentance. That even in, in Psalm 23, there's an idea of the comfort and restoration of the soul of the sheep is, comes from God coming alongside it and turning the sheep back and bringing him or her home. 
So the deep sort of implication is the turning back, this repentance. And we know from God's word, if you remember from uh, Pastor Edgardo's sermon from a a few weeks ago, that that God, yes, is a God of judgment. He cares about justice and and goodness in the world. But he is is also a God of mercy. Ezekiel 33, as Edgardo said, one of his his favorite verses in the Old Testament, I, I love this. God says, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, of the wicked, I don't know what's included there when you think of wicked. Maybe it's war criminals. Maybe it's people who assault other people. Maybe it's people like John Newton. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. And he says, turn, turn from your evil ways. As you see here, the the Pharisees that Jesus is talking to, we have to remember the context, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they are supposed to be the shepherds of God's people, Israel, at the time. They were the religious leaders. And so Jesus is rebuking them for, for separating themselves from the sheep. Not going and searching for the sheep, but, but separating themselves, disowning, cutting off these sheep. Ezekiel 34 talks about this. Again, Jesus is bringing this into here, and he says, and you'll see excerpts of it on the screen, but you can listen to the whole bit. It says, Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curd, you clothe yourselves with the wool and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. They were scattered over the whole earth and no one searched or looked for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. I myself, God says, will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I I will tend them in a good pasture. And the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. I will shepherd the flock with justice. Jesus in Luke 15 is fulfilling prophecy from Ezekiel. He's saying the shepherds of Israel, the pastors, the religious leaders of Israel, you are failing the people. And so I am going to myself come and be the true shepherd. Or as Jesus says in John 10, the good shepherd. And what cost, what does it take for him to go and seek out and find these lost sheep, to to bring them back into fellowship with the shepherd, into relationship with God? He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus comes to earth as the good shepherd to seek out the lost sheep. But as he comes to earth as the good shepherd, he becomes himself the lamb of God, a sheep himself who who lays down his life, who, who spills his own blood so that he would cover up the sins of the world. Jesus lives the life that we should have lived. He dies the death that we should have died. He takes the punishment on himself that we deserved. And for all those who believe in him, he restores their soul. He picks them up. He puts them on their shoulders. He turns them back and brings them home. Church, that is the good news. That is the gospel. And all it takes to receive this gift of grace is to believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, to let him carry you, to turn you, and to to slowly begin to shift your life back into worship and devotion towards God. Again, not just about the rules, not just about keeping the rules, but about the relationship with God 
through Christ. But the shepherd doesn't just search. He sings. You, you see that? The, the, the title of his sermon is What Makes God Happy? You, you see that when he finds it, he puts it on his shoulders, he, he goes home, and then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. He says, I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. There is rejoicing in heaven over just one wicked person like you and me that God saves and turns back and brings home. Uh, Linda Smith, one of our elders, uh, at the last few weeks ago, uh, her cat, Honey, went missing. She was lost. And as Linda was looking, she could put up signs, got neighbors together to go out and, and do a search for her cat and could not find her. Days turned into weeks, and it just seemed like it's just too long for a cat to just survive out there. Like, maybe she's not going to be back. But weeks later, Honey seemingly miraculously showed up. And it was a, a family in Newton, I think it was, somewhere way far, that found Honey and took her in and then, and then used the tag other things to, to connect Honey back with Linda. And I remember, you know, we were kind of praying and, 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 and I remember sort of losing hope. Like, you know, it's, it's getting past that time when usually animals, when they're gone, they're kind of gone. And just was so shocked. And, and I remember Linda shared with, with our community group that, that she was so excited that, that she gathered all those neighbors who had gone out to help. She gathered them and had a party at her house. And, and she had a little card. And, and in the card that she gave as a party favor to, to everyone had, had a, a scripture passage, uh, I think from, from Luke 15 in it. And Honey is a great cat. Linda's my neighbor, so I know. she's a great cat. But church, how much more? How much more should we rejoice? How much more does the Lord rejoice over people, lost sinners who are found? And again, you know, I'm taking a little bit of liberty here to say that the, the shepherd rejoices. There's nothing about singing here, but, but I get this from one of my favorite, my favorite passages in the Old Testament, from Zephaniah chapter 3. It says, Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart. The Lord has taken away your punishment. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. God sings over lost, wicked sinners who turn back to him. He gets so excited. All of heaven rejoices. And church, the, the past shepherds of God's people, including the Pharisees, they failed. They separated so much. They were so concerned about keeping all the rules that they scattered sheep all over the wilderness. Church, we are called to be holy. I don't want to, to de-emphasize the importance of, of our moral actions. We are called to love one another so much so that people see God in the, the holy love we have for one another. We're called to adorn the gospel. We're called to do works, good works that bring glory to the Lord. But we need to be careful that we don't fall into a Phariseeism, that we're not living so set apart that we neglect to seek out the lost around us. That we don't focus so much on separating that we miss God's call for us to search. The word in verse 4 for go after, though doesn't he lead the 99 in the open country and go after the one? It's the same word that Jesus uses for the disciples in, in uh, Matthew chapter 10, and when they, he sends them out to preach the gospel and to heal. He says, you, you go after the sheep of the house of Israel. No one is too far gone. In this life, no sheep can stray too far. And so church, the question for us this morning is certainly looking at our own lives, making sure we're cultivating that relationship with the Lord. But, but brothers and sisters, are we willing to go and search like Jesus? 
those who were lost and are now found, are we willing to go? What makes God happy? Does it make us happy too? Is it, is it a great source of joy for us to see lost people come to know Jesus? Are we willing to bear the costs of this? Are we willing to really say God's priority seems a little bit weird that he would leave 99 to go after the one? Doesn't seem completely fair that all of the attention, all of the focus goes after the lost. Are we willing to rearrange our priorities that seem maybe not the most fair, maybe not the most pragmatic to the culture around us to seek out those who are lost spiritually? Are we willing to live out our mission statement that we've articulated? Right in the front of the bulletin, inviting Boston and beyond into a life-changing relationship with Christ and his church. Are we willing to, to even to let go in some ways of the church that we're used to, to make space for others to come in? And church, the problem is, is that if you ask the Pharisees if they cared about lost people, if they cared about bringing people into a good, right relationship with God, they would say, sure, sure I am. This is easy to say but how challenging to do. It's easy to say and believe, yeah, sure, we, we welcome all people. But the discerning factor isn't what we say. The discerning factor is what we do. Is, is how do we respond? How, how do we go after someone who are different than us? Someone who, who looks different or, or talks different or votes different or smells different than you. It's easy to say, yeah, all are welcome. But I don't know about you, but sometimes my heart is just, yeah, I don't know. Maybe someone else can. <laughs> someone else can reach out to that person. I'm good. It's easy to say that we want to love, welcome, rescue, partner with Jesus in this and the mission he's given us. But instead we, we isolate, perhaps silently judge. You know, briefly, this, this actually happened to me. I asked permission with, with, with Yusuke. When Yusuke uh, first came uh, to us, I don't know where, where he's at. Where, oh, you're right. Okay. <laughs> when Yusuke first came to us, he was like, hey, I'm here to explore Christianity because my girlfriend is a Christian, and so I feel like I, I should explore, uh, explore faith. And, uh, and I said, well, you're just here for your girlfriend. I said, all right, you know. So I met with him, and, and uh, I said, yeah, okay, he's— I guess he's interested, but he really is just, you know, wanting to make sure. He, he really, he, he loves his girlfriend more than he loves God. And so I kind of wrote him off. And so I said, you know, Mike, Mike Crandall. I said, Mike, Mike, you should, you should connect with Yusuke and just see, you know. And through Mike, simply sharing a book, praying with Yusuke, God did a miraculous and it was shame on me for my prejudgment on Yusuke. And, and last week, last Saturday, at our, uh, uh, we had a New Testament conference here. Yusuke was sitting right up here in the front row. And on either side of him were, were two people, not Christians, who he's loving and serving and praying for and helping to see as they process their own journey and trying to, to go from, from lost to, to found. Praise God. Praise God for that. And, and, and shame on me. And so, church, I'm, I'm not, like, not including myself in this. Like, we all, we need to watch out for this Phariseeism in our own lives. And so if you want to get really practical, that's a, a quick way to, how, how do we do this? How do we practically keep our focus on the lost? And this comes from uh, Whitney, uh, because she wrote the community group questions last week, and she wrote this question. It was so powerful. She said, you know, you can emphasize as a believer your goodness. And that's important. God is doing uh, sanctifying work in your life. And, and we, again, we do good works. We adorn the gospel, all of those things. You can emphasize that. Or, or you can constantly remember not your goodness, but your foundness. You can say, yes, praise God for the sanctifying work, for the good works he's doing. But, but remembering constantly how far we were lost. And yet we have been found. And being found is passive voice. It's an action that, that is put on you. 
I know the world talks about finding yourself, but that's baloney, right? It's, a, it's really, it's, it's about God finding us. That's what happened to that wicked slave trader, John Newton. And that day, God rescued him physically and spiritually, and he never forgot his foundness. Of course, he came a, uh, became a hymn writer, became a pastor, and he, he changed from not only being a sinner himself, but, but leading other people into sin to then living the rest of his life doing the best he could to remember how lost he was, remember his foundness, and to lead as many, many people as he could to Jesus. In time, hundreds of people would gather weekly on Sundays to listen to his sermons. And ultimately, it was, it was Newton focusing on his foundness that led him to value, not just the people around him, but led him to, to realize the wickedness of his sin and slavery. And he led the charge, mentoring a young man named William Wilberforce, led the charge for abolishing the slave trade in the British Empire. A former slave trader turned liberator. A former slave became free. Someone who was lost and is now found. And so church... I think this text for us, God's word for us this morning, is to remember your sheepiness. Remember how easily you go astray. But also remember how the good shepherd searched for you, who sings over you even now. And let us remember our foundness even more than our goodness. And let that empower us to go out and partner with the good shepherd to see more and more lost sheep come to know his love. Let's pray. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found was blind, but now I see. Lord, may that be our song. May that be our boast. May that be our desire, our focus. May that be the pasture from which we feed as we remember your amazing grace towards us. And may that empower a radical generosity, a radical searching as you give us the privilege of partnering with you in your mission to see more and more lost sheep be brought home. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.